went out in the rain. <laughs> this morning I went out in the rain and fished out the coffee from the trash can and wiped it off. <laughs> I I put it in very carefully. It's been it's been cold out, so it's acted like a refrigerator. So we'll we'll test out the coffee and see if it survived in the trash can. Well, it's a light mm, test. Quite good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Best trash can well, coffee I've ever had. Best trash can coffee I've ever had. Thank you so much. I have no idea how you got it here, but that's great. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, so today I'm going to talk about relational programming, not logic programming. Okay. So mini Canron is not a logic programming language, in my opinion. It started out as a logic programming language. And some people use it as logic programming language, but that's not what's interesting about mini Canon, in my opinion, okay? So if you think about programming paradigms, all the different ways uh, that we can structure programs, all the different approaches to writing programs, there are things like procedural programming, object-oriented programming. You might have things like J or APL, like array-based programming. There are things like fourth, like stack-based programming and so forth. Obviously there's functional programming. And then there's these multi-paradigm languages like Scheme, which I program in a lot, is actually a multi-paradigm language. Same with Racket, right? So these are multi-paradigm languages. Um, and then there is this idea of logic programming or functional programming. By the way, I see I see uh, there's a, a yellow outline around Jason, so I don't know if that's uh, he's being recorded instead of me. Anyway, um, I can can I pin myself? I don't know if that, okay. Anyway, um, yeah, you may have to pin me uh, as the host order. So. Uh, there are different approaches to structuring programs or structuring computation, how we want to write things. And one traditional approach, sort of traditional at this point, is what's called logic programming. And that uh, the most famous logic programming language or family of languages is Prolog, which really came out in the early 1970s. And, uh, you know, the sort of loosely inspired by logic is, is one way you might uh, consider logic programming. And in, in a language like Prolog, the idea is that you take some problem you care about and you encode that problem in some sense in mathematical logic or logical formulism. And then you have the underlying logic engine try to solve the problem through a combination of search and some constraint solving, usually something like unification. That's normally how logic programming works. In traditional logic programming as in Prolog, there are all sorts of operations to control the search, to make the search more efficient. And that can give you more expressive power in addition to efficiency. In particular, dealing with negation can be tricky in, in this uh, style of programming. All right, and so, so relational programming, which I'm gonna show you, has similar uh, features. Uh, there is a search and constraint solving under the hood. Dealing with negation can be tricky. We're a general purpose language, at least in terms of being Turing complete, that's similar to Prolog. But the emphasis is different. So in, in oh, Prolog, really? you're, yes. I shall there. Are you using slides, uh, which you wanted to share with us? Uh, uh, no, but I will share right. my Emacs. I'm gonna share my Emacs in a minute. All right, great, great. all right. Yeah, you'll see my beautiful face right now, but then we'll, <laughs> then we'll share yeah. my Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna be a talking head for a minute. Anyway, so, so uh, in relational programming, the emphasis is gonna be a little bit different. In logic programming, we're writing down these logical formulas. We're trying to model some pro problem in the real world using a logical specification. And then we're sort of giving hints to the underlying system or cutting off the search to try to make it more efficient, that kind of thing. The relational programming approach has a different, different emphasis. In relational programming, we care about modeling the world as mathematical relations. This is similar to functional programming, where we're modeling problems as mathematical functions. Here we're going to model problems as mathematical relations. And the main 
the main point is we're no longer going to distinguish between inputs and outputs to a function or to to a relation. Okay, so so in functional programming or procedural programming or object oriented programming with methods, there's a clear distinction between the inputs to a function or a method or procedure and the outputs. Inputs and outputs are different things. And we're, we're used to thinking about this from mathematics where you have, you can think of your function as a black box that takes some inputs and produces an output. Okay, and there's really a distinction. In relational programming, we don't care about that distinction. We get rid of it. All, of we, ha all we have are arguments and there's no notion of input and output. We're gonna treat them all uh, the same. And that gives us a lot of flexibility. The, the other part of this is we are allowed to put in placeholder values, uh, what we call logic variables, representing unknown values. And then the system will try to fill those in. And, the, and Prolog can do this as well. But once again, the emphasis is, is different. So in Prolog, you write a few programs, a very simple programs as relations. And then if you read a prologue book, then they say, well, this is too hard to do in general or it's too, too inefficient. So we're gonna stop writing programs as relations and we will use all these what are called extra logical features like cut and assert and retract and so forth uh, to give you more control over the search and constraint solving. And you know, we're, we'll give up on writing programs as relations. So mini Canron in my mind, at least from sort of the research standpoint is all about staying true to this relational idea which is similar to, if, if you look at the Haskell programming language for functional programming, Haskell is about laziness and purity. Because as soon as you have lazy, uh, you have a, a, a language based on lazy evaluation, you have to be pure. And that's where all the monads come in and things like that. So it led to lots of innovation in programming languages because you're sort of stuck in some way. As soon as you commit to being lazy and mini Canon is similar in that as soon as you commit 100% to, to writing every program as a relation, which means you can put logic variables anywhere at any time in any argument position or within a, a part of an argument, uh, now you have to think about programming in a very different way, even a very different way than in logic programming. And so that leads to lots of interesting challenges, but also leads to interesting results that, that are different than what you usually see. Okay, so, so philosophically, this is very different than logic programming, even though there, there are similarities like unification that comes up, okay? But we're trying to do something different. So I don't, I don't really think of mini Canron as a logic programming language, although you can use it as that. Okay, mathematical relations, that's right. Reminds you of discrete math, yes? Yep, that's right. Okay, so let's go ahead and share a screen and get some mini Canron going. Here we go. All right, got beautiful Emacs. Now let's open up faster mini Ganron. Be using the faster mini Ganron implementation. Oh, I say it's MK Shea. Yay, okay, great. I'm, I'm using Shea Scheme as the host language. So, so one thing you have to understand is mini Canon is usually implemented as uh, an embedded domain specific language and Jason's gonna talk about this in a minute. In this case, our host language is a Scheme, the Shea Scheme implementation of Scheme. So I've loaded the files that define mini Canon in Scheme. And now I have the basic language available. And the basic language is very, very small. This is a tiny language. And so uh, there, there are really only three core logical operators and then one interface operator. So, so in, in, uh, in functional programming or in, in say scheme or racket, let's say, uh, you know, we have a Lisp-like Lisp language and we have uh, values like five. Okay, this is this is a scheme here. This isn't mini Canon yet. So we have values like five. We can quote um, quote symbols. So we have symbolic values like cat or knight 
you know, if we want to think of a chess piece or something like that. And then we also have things like lists. So I can say list of cat dog. Okay, so we have values like this. And then we have things like true and false. All right, so we have some values and we'll inherit those values as part of mini Cameron. So we have those values, lists and pairs, <clears throat> symbols, numbers, true and false. All right, great. So th those are values we can talk about. And once we have those values, if we were in scheme or racket, then we can ask questions like are two values the same? So I can say, is the list, or sorry, <clears throat> I'll say is the list uh, cat dog, is that equal to the list cat dog? Yes, I get back true value. And if I change this, if I reorder those, then it's false. And so we have the notion of equality over two different values. Now in, in mini Canron, we're going to extend that notion a little bit. So instead of equal, which is, which is just something built into scheme or racket, we are going to use a new operator called equal equal. And this is the first of our mini Canron operators, equal equal. Equal equal uh, is similar to this equal question mark operator, except you can also view it as an assertion instead of a question. We're asserting that these two values are the same. We're not just asking if they are, we're saying, you know, these two values have to be the same or we fail, okay? If, if, if they are the same value or can be made to be the same value, we succeed and proceed on. Otherwise we fail and have to stop. All right, so I can try running this. I can try evaluating that expression and I get back a procedure. And the reason I get back a procedure is instead of something representing failure or success, which is what we talk about in relational programming. The reason I get back a procedure is that scheme or racket don't actually know about mini Canron, which is an embedded domain specific language we have to somehow have an interface operator, operator between the world of mini Canron, which includes things like equal equal and the normal scheme world or the normal racket world. And that interface operator is called run. So equal equal is a logical operator, but we also have to wrap our use of equal equal within a, a run expression. So here, the run expression says we want one value if it exists, that wants one value. Q is what we call our query variable. I could pick any name here, but uh, by convention, we tend to pick Q. And you could think of it as asking a, a question. And the question we're asking is for which value of Q is it true that the list cat dog is equal to the list dog cat? Okay, well, those values just aren't the same. The list cat dog and list dog cat are different. And so if you were to ask in scheme, if those are equal, you would get hash F, right? And there's no value of Q, no matter what value we would pick for Q, we could make Q be five or Q be fire department or whatever. There's no value of Q that would affect the fact that the list cat dog is different from the list dog cat. So we're going to fail. And when I run this computation, you'll see that we get it back an empty list. So this list represents the values of Q of our query variable Q, the possible values of Q that would make these, uh, make these two uh, values the same, make the equal equal succeed. Well, uh, there's no value of Q for which the list cat dog is equal to the list dog cat. But I can change my program a little bit. Now I'm asking for which values of Q is the list cat dog equals the list cat dog? Well, in this case, it's for any value of Q. For any value of Q, it is true that the list cat dog is equal to the list cat dog. Uh, and when I run the computation, yes. Can I just uh, interrupt? Uh, sure. so some people are kind of like asking uh, what is the meaning of like the run one? Ah, okay. So, so the meaning of run one is we want because okay, so run is the interface operation. 
between Mini Cameron, which is our embedded language for relational programming and scheme or host language. One means that we want at most one answer if it exists. It turns out that we will be able to get back multiple answers or even infinitely many answers. So in this case, we want to say that we want at most one answer. And then here within this list of query variables, we want to say we're going to talk about this query variable Q and that's the value of Q is the, the, the value we care about. You'll, you'll see in a second a more interesting example. All right, and, and hopefully it will become obvious in, in a second. Uh, in the beginning, it looks a little weird because I'm not involving Q in the simple, the simple query. But you'll see in a second, we'll start using the query variables. Hopefully, they'll become a little more obvious. And we'll start changing the numbers. OK, okay. so uh, in this case, we're asking, for what values of the query variable Q is it true that the list cat dog is equal to the list cat dog. And the answer is for any value of Q, because Q is not involved in the computation and those lists are already equal. And we represent that fact by saying that, uh, by representing the query variable as this underscore dot number. Okay, whenever you see an underscore dot number in the answer, that means that for the query variable we care about, any value of the query variable would satisfy the relations we're building up. Now, let me make it a little more obvious what's going on. Let's actually put the query variable inside one of the lists. Now we're asking for which value of Q is it the case that the list cat dog is equal to the list Q dog? Okay. Well, this would be true if Q happens to be the symbol cat. If, if Q is the symbol cat, then those two lists are the same. Right? So if I run it, I can see that Q must be the, uh, the symbol cat. Right? So now we're starting to see our query variable involved in the query. And of course, I could put it in different positions. In fact, I could also do something like put it in uh, the same position in both lists. So I could say, for what value of Q, is the list Q dog equal to the list Q dog? Well, for any value of Q, it doesn't matter what the value of Q is, those two lists will be the same. And then I can evaluate that. And sure enough, I get this representation, this underscore dot zero saying that Q can have any value whatsoever. Okay. And so I can start building up more and more complicated, more and more sophisticated uh, problems just using this notion of equal equal, which is syntactic equality. I want to say that that the two arguments to equal equal syntactically are equal. And I can, um, well, okay, so I could also do something like this. I, if I want to, I can do something like say, I'm gonna have two query variables, X and Y. And I'll say, I can set up my problem this way. So I can ask for which values x and y, is it true that the list x cat is equal to the list dog y? So in this case, what would I expect my values for x and y to be? Any idea? Cat and dog. Yeah, cat and dog, that's right. So in this case, we get back a list representing the values of x and y, since we have more than one uh, query variable. And so the first element uh, here represents the value of x, which is cat. And the second element represents the value of y, which is dog. So this is saying when x is cat and y is dog, then the list x dog is equal to the list cat y. Right. So now we're building up some constraints saying when something's true or asking when something's true or asserting when something's true, if you want to think of it that way. Okay, so we've already seen half of the basic mini Cameron language, which involves equal equal, which is this constraint operator, which under the hood is implemented using something called unification, which Jason, I think we'll talk about. And then we have the interface operator between mini Cameron and scheme. All right, now it may not look very useful, we're only able to answer these very simple questions about 
what makes these two values the same? For which values of these query variables are these two, uh, two lists the same in this case? Uh, it doesn't look very powerful, but actually it turns out to be extremely powerful because we're gonna add a couple other operators and we're gonna add recursion. And now we're gonna have a Turing complete language where we can express any computation. All right, so let me add another thing uh, to our language. That's uh, the ability to produce more than one answer. And this is why we need a one and run one. So we'll, we'll start changing that, that value. So I, for example, can create uh, two Condi clauses. Okay, so there's Condi. If you're familiar with Lisp, with Lisps, there's an operator called Cond, which exists in Scheme and Racket, for example, and Common Lisp, and, and many versions of Lisp. Cond is McCarthy's, John McCarthy's conditional operator. And so Condi is sort of copied off that. The idea, of the E in Condi is, stands for every. We're going to try every clause. So Condi syntactically has one or more clauses. In this case, we have two clauses. And what's going to happen is we're going to try um, all of these clauses to see if we can uh, come up with answers for our query variables or values for our query variables that satisfy uh, the relations we're building up. Okay, so um, this is similar logically to an or. This is like a disjunction. So we're saying, it, you know, either X is five or X is six. That's how you can think of it. This is like a big or. So I can ask for what values of my query value, uh, variable X, is it true that X is equal to five or X is equal to six? Well, one possible value of X then would be five. Okay, so that's, that's from the first clause. However, there's a second answer. So I can ask for two answers instead of one answer. And because logically this is an or, or works similarly to an or, basically x could be five or x could be six. Those are both legal values. And so if I do run two, I get two values back instead of one value. And I can always ask for all the values by doing run star. Run star says, give me every possible value. Okay. And so if we look at this expression, what I'm really asking is for which values of the query variable X, is it true that either X is five or X is six is true? That those, those, those two things are the same, okay? And in this case, it's very simple. Either X is five or X is six. But Condi allows me to have multiple values. That's the sort of the main point. I am allowed to make different choices and these choices are completely independent of each other. Okay. One Condi clause never affects the other Condi clauses. So now we have the ability to get more than one answer back. So now you've seen two thirds of the logical language. We have Condi as a logical operation, which acts like an or, and we have equal equal, which acts as like an equality operator. And then the last operator we have in Mini Kenrin is what's called fresh. This is the last core operator. And what fresh allows us to do is introduce new locally lexically scoped query variables, okay, or, or logic variables, if you want to call them logic variables. So now we have the query variable X, which is the value we will see in the result in the answer but we've introduced some local uh, query variables Y and Z that don't have any value associated with them to begin with. And now uh, we can actually start doing uh, conjunction. So this is like an and inside of a fresh. We can have an and. And so we can say things like, well, we wanna make Y and Z have the same value. Now this is different from normal programming, normal programming in that Y and Z don't yet have a value. I haven't told you what Y is. Y could be a list, it could be the number five, it could be a Boolean value, who knows? And I'm just saying that Y and Z have the same value. So now I'm really building up a set of constraints. I don't know what Y is, I don't know what Z is, but I am saying they have the same value. And I can also add another constraint and I can say, you know what, X is also equal to Z, right? 
And then I can add a third constraint and I can say, you know, Y is equal to, I don't know, five. Right. And so all of these constraints have to be solved simultaneously. So what I'm asking, here's, here's what the question is asking. For what value of X is it true that Y is equal to Z, X is equal to Z, and Y is equal to five? Well, in order for this to be satisfied, the only way it can be satisfied is if X is five. Okay, so you can see that these associations are being built up. And even though we never directly say X is five, we say X is the same as Z and Y is the same as Z and Y is the same as five. So therefore the only possible solution is when X is five. All right, and so this has acting like an and, the body of a fresh acts like an and. All right, so we have and from fresh, or from Condi, the notion of syntactic equality from equal equal, which is based on unification. And then we have this operator, the run interface operator, which is run star, which acts between um, uh, mini Canron and the host language in this case scheme. And that's it, that's the basic language, okay? I'll show you another uh, operator or two as we go along, but that's the basic uh, language. Very, very small, only three operators. Um, JSON actually has a language even smaller than many Canron called Micro Canron, uh, sort of like even makes this language uh, uh, simpler. But that's the basic language. We inherit numbers and other values like lists from scheme or from our host language in this case and scheme. And we also have the ability that we inherit from scheme in this case to define uh, functions or, or relations. And you know, we have Lambda in scheme, uh, which allows us to create closures, that sort of thing. We inherit that ability, but we have to use it uh, in, a, in a restricted way. All right, so let me just show you a real relation. Okay, so, so this is a, these are sort of the building blocks, but now let me show you something uh, real. And this is sort of the traditional example in logic programming, by the way, in Prolog. This is a very common example. So I'll show you sort of this Prolog type program, which is a relation. And then I'll show you a more complicated relation that, that goes beyond what you would normally see in a language like Prolog. So let's define uh, the notion of con concatenating or appending lists. Um, you know, now there's already a notion of appending lists that is built into scheme. And so I can say, I want to append uh, the lists ABC and the lists uh, uh, DE, for example. Okay, I'm gonna squish those two lists together. And when I do that, I get back the list ABC, DE, okay? All right, just concatenating these two lists. We're going to do something similar, except instead of using the append uh, function, we're going to write an append relation. Now, just to give you a little bit of sense, because we'll see this again in a minute, let me show you how you might define append in scheme, not in many Canon, but just in scheme. In this case, I'm gonna use let rec, which allows me to define locally um, a recursive function. So we'll define it this way. And here's my buddy Cond again. Okay. So I can say if the first list is empty, we're going to return the second argument. So, so append is a function, it takes two arguments. Uh, otherwise, what we're going to do is we're gonna cons the first part of L, that's the car of L, to the result of the recursive call. Dent this, make it a little easier to read. To the rest of the first argument, the cutter, to S. Okay, so this is the standard definition of append. And in fact, I can just now grab my call to append from before stick it inside the body of the let rec and it works. Okay, so this is just defining it in scheme. There's, or this is nothing special. This works in scheme, works in racket. Standard recursive definition of append over lists. This is what you learn in any introductory course on 
uh, scheme programming. This is what you might learn in the little schema, for example. Okay, great. That's how it works in, in scheme. And notice there's a very clear distinction between inputs and outputs. So here, append is a function that takes two arguments, takes two lists, and then returns another list. We have two input arguments, and we have one output. Now we're going to do the same thing, except we are going to define append as a relation instead of as a function. And so I will show you how it looks in mini Canron. So we're going to define something called appendo instead of append. And I will do it this way, ls and then l plus s. So you can already see there are two differences. First of all, I call it appendo instead of append. That's just our convention, our naming convention. Secondly, you can see that I'm taking a third argument. Appendo takes a third argument, three arguments, not two. Okay. This last argument, L plus S, you can think metaphorically, this is similar in spirit to the value you would have gotten as the output of append. But now we're not talking about inputs and outputs. So it's, it's a little bit different. Okay. So we have three arguments. And now instead of cond, I'm going to have a cond D. We don't have null question mark. All we have are things like equal equal. So instead of asking if the list L is empty, I can say using equal equal that L has to be equal to the empty list. That's the same intent as the null question mark. However, it's actually more general because null question mark only works, that's only going to give you a true or false value if L happens to be either the empty list or not. Whereas here, if L doesn't yet have a value associated with it, if L is a fresh logic variable, then L will become the empty list. So it's not just acting as a question, it's also acting as an assertion. If you don't have a value for L, make it the empty list. That's what it's really saying. Okay, and in that case, we could say instead of returning, normally we would return the second argument s. In this case, we don't return values anymore. We only unify or associate values with each other. So I would say that the L plus s, that third argument, is equal to s. So instead of returning values, I now associate values together. So that would be equivalent to this first con clause of the null test and returning s, now we don't explicitly return a value, we just associate values. And we don't have things like null question mark. Instead, we use equal equal. Equal equal is this big hammer, this big constraint operator. It can be used in many ways. And we're using it in two ways here, really. OK. And then for the second Condi's clause, this is a little more complicated. And I'm not going to go into all the details because of time. But basically, we're going to have to introduce some locally scoped uh, temporary variables to help us out. And what we're going to do is we're going to tear apart that first list into a pair that contains a first part and a rest part, the car and the cutter. And we can now make a recursive call. So if we recur on the rest of the list and S, we will get some temporary result res. And now we can say that we want to associate the third or the output argument, if you want to think of it that way, as the cons of the first thing in L to that result. OK. It looks a little different. It looks maybe a little strange if you're used to functional programming. Uh, but hopefully, you can see that there is some connection between the code I'm writing and uh, the scheme definition. Okay, so the, the, you have to learn a slightly different way of writing it. It's not that hard to learn. I'm going to do a little bit of a sleight of hand here. This is actually the trickiest part of the whole talk. I just swap those two last lines for reasons that I may or may not have time to get into. Uh, that turns out to be very important, by the way. Uh, I want you normally want these calls to equal equal to come before your recursions. But anyway, now we have this definition of appendo. And so now we can try running this new query, uh, new, or sorry, new relation. And we'll use our friend run again. So we have query variable Q. And so I'll say, if I append the list, do my uh, old example, ABC, to the list uh, DE, then, well, now it has to take three arguments instead of two. So I'll say, 
Q is going to be the result, if you want to think of it that way, of appending these two lists. So when I append ABC to DE, that result of those that appending, I'm going to call Q. All right, so now I can try running this and I get back a list of answers that contains one, one answer. And that answer is the list ABCDE. So this would be similar to what, it, what I get back. It would be the exact result I get back if I just called append on list ABC and list DE. Okay, so now my appendo is acting like append and scheme. Mm, seems kind of a complicated way to go about that, but it turns out that my appendo definition is more flexible than append because it's written as a relation. And so what that means is that I can actually do more interesting things. So I can, I can say that I know the output, for example, I'll write it this way to make it a little accessible. Okay, I can say the output is going to be the list ABCDE, or the third argument will be the list ABCDE. And now I can say, well, what would be the second list then? Okay, so now I can set up the problem differently. I could say if I append ABC, you know, and the list Q, where Q is unknown, I want to get back ABCDE. Well, what must Q be then? Okay, so now I'm asking. Uh, sort of an algebra problem. Fill in the value of Q that would make this true. And Mini Canron is going to do a search and constraint solving and say, oh, okay, in that case, Q must be the list DE. All right, so it's sort of run backwards a little bit. And I could do something more sophisticated. I could say, uh, let's have two lists, X and Y. And what I'll do is I'll say, we're going to append the list X to the list Y to give us the list A, B, C, D, E. So what are those two lists X and Y that would allow this to be true? Well, one answer, if I do a run one, is X could be the empty list and Y could be the list A, B, C, D, E. But I could also say, you know, I could say, give me a second answer, run two. And now we see, oh, well, X could be the list A and Y could be the list B, C, D, E. And in fact, I might ask for all the answers. And now I see I get six answers back. And I can format those to make them look nicely. And I can see I get, I get all prefixes of this list and all su suffixes of the list. Okay, so now I can get back multiple answers. In fact, I can even ask questions like, well, what if I had a third list Z? Now I'm asking, give me all the pairs of lists X and Y that when you concatenate them, give you a list Z, what do those look like, okay? Um, uh, uh, there are actually many, infinitely many in this case. And so if I run this, this will go an infinite loop, but I could say, well, give me, you know, the first example. All right, and so in that case, look at the answer. Now we're starting to get theorems, basically. So here, the first answer is X is, if X is the empty list and Y is anything, then Z is the same as Y. Notice that they have the same numbers. That means that they actually have the same value. This is a very, very general answer. This actually represents infinitely many answers. That's why I say it's a theorem. We can ask for a second uh, result. And now we're saying, well, if we have a list containing of length one containing any value appended to some other thing, now we get back this pair structure. Okay, so we're starting to get into uh, very general answers, the sort of theorem answers. Okay, let me stop for one second and I see that there's some questions or comments in chat. Okay, yeah, okay, it is cool. Now, let me show you, okay, that's, that's what you'd see in a prologue book, okay? So, so let, just to be clear, we're not going beyond prologue at this point, but now we're about to. Okay. So here is the interesting thing. When you see this style of programming, you can see this very flexible, okay? And I only showed you some of the flexibility. You've, even for Appendo, you can do a lot more. Um, but now the question comes up, can this be pushed any further? If you pick up a prologue book, you'll see Append. You might see one other example, but that's about it. There are always these very, very simple examples. And then they move on to controlling the search using these extra logical operators. They basically give up on relational programming almost immediately after this example. 
Okay, so the question is, what if we decide all of our programs are gonna work like this? You know, that's really the mini Cameron question, the research question. Can we program in the style where every program we write has this level of flexibility or more? Uh, and so that's what we're trying to figure out. Now, one question, or sorry, one, one thing that you might ask is if you're interested in programming languages, okay, what do you do in programming languages? Well, one of the things you do when you study programming languages is you do things like write interpreters, okay, or evaluators. And in scheme world, like if you learn scheme, sort of the first exercise you learn when you become good at scheme is you implement scheme in terms of scheme. You know, you might implement a scheme compiler and scheme, uh, but you'll definitely implement a scheme interpreter written in scheme, a meta circular interpreter. Okay. And so one of the questions is, can you implement a meta circular scheme interpreter, an interpreter like that, but can you do it in mini Canron? Can you, can you implement a scheme interpreter? I shouldn't call it meta circular. It's really not, although I'm working on that. Um, can you implement a scheme interpreter as a relation in the same style? And the answer is yes, you can. In fact, um, I'm going to load one right now. And this is always the hardest part is uh, uh, picking the, the right file. OK, here we go. This is the one I want to load. This is the one I want to load. All right. So we are going to write, uh, I just loaded a little interpreter. Now, if you're not familiar with uh, how these interpreters work, basically they give you a function called eval. Now in scheme, I'm allowed to, you know, I can have expressions like plus three, four. Okay, so plus three, four, if I evaluate that at the, the prompt or the REPL, read eval print loop line, uh, I get back the value seven. But I can also quote uh, this, this expression. Okay, whenever that little quote mark up front, means treat this as data. So now I get back a list plus three, four, which in some sense represents a, a code or a program, but I haven't, you know, now I just have this list. I'm not getting back seven anymore, but I can use the scheme function eval that can take some quoted code. It can take a list representing code and, and treat that as code and evaluate it. Okay, so eval allows me to take some data structure representing code and just go ahead and evaluate and get the answer back. So we have, just like we went from append and scheme to appendo in mini Canron, we've gone from a val and scheme to evalo in mini Canron. So we have the relational equivalent of a val. Notice a val takes one argument, which is an expression we want to evaluate, and it gives us back one value, which is the value of the expression. So we're going to have the relational version of that, which is evalo. So now I can. I can write down a run expression that takes a valo, and I can say, all right, let's let's um, you know, in this case, let's evaluate a called li uh, list of cat dog, um, like that, and let's see what the value of that expression is. And sure enough, we get back the list cat dog as the value. Okay, so oh, sorry, we can, can have. Can so here, what you're saying is that Q evaluates to that, right? What uh, it's not that Q evaluates to it. It's more like uh, we can ask for wh what value for what value of Q is it true that evaluating the code with this code oh, list okay. cat dog is equal to Q? <clears throat> okay. So in this case, you could I could maybe call it val. All right. All right. And now in this case, you could think of it as sort of like the output of a val, the way I'm writing it right now. Right. So if you think of sort of going in a forward direction, if I called a val on list cat dog, I would get back val. And so if I run this, in fact, I can do exactly that. So I can take the code I'm evaluating and I just call schema val and we can compare the answer. And sure enough, I get cat dog. Okay. So that's all it means in that case. Now, where this becomes more interesting is it because we're a relation, instead of talking about the value of the expression, I can actually switch things around and I can say, you know, I want, I want an expression whose value is the list cat dog. I want to know an expression in my subset of scheme I'm handling that when you evaluate the expression, you get back the list cat dog. You know, so let me just try it. 
come up, you know, so basically now I'm doing program synthesis. I'm saying I want a scheme expression that evaluates the cat dog, the list cat dog. All right, so come up with one. Mini Cameron, figure out a scheme expression that evaluates the cat dog. Okay, here we go. Quote cat dog. Just quote the expression. That's true. But give me a second one. Okay, list quote cat quote dog. Okay, give me a third one. Okay, well, look, now we have this lambda expression. I'll just grab it. It's got some side conditions I don't care about. <clears throat> okay, it's a little hard to read because it's got these underscore zeros and underscore ones, but this basically is any symbol, so I call it X. And this also is any symbol, so I can call this, you know, uh, I don't know, fox, right? And if I evaluate that, I get back to cat dog. So we're starting to invent code that includes lambdas and, and you know, anonymous functions and procedure application and things like that. Um, you know, Matt Might, who I've worked with for many years, he has a blog post on, uh, you know, uh, on Racket where you know it's called 99 ways to say I love you in Racket. And the idea is to have people who are beginning to learn schema Racket come up with 99 scheme expressions that evaluate to the list I love you. And so we can express that problem directly just by saying run 99. Okay, give me 99 expressions in the scheme that evaluate the list I love you. And then here we go. All right. And I can I can try any of these out. Uh, I'll try that one. You know, the value the list I love you. You have to kind of look at it and figure out what's going on, but sure enough, it does. Okay. And now let me show you another interesting trick. This is related. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm not following chat very well here. Uh, let me, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And now, now, um, John, John McCarthy, who, by the way, in my opinion, is one of the great computer scientists of all time, uh, you should definitely go and read his papers. Um, uh, he has this paper from the 70s called a micro manual for Lisp, not the whole truth. So basically he has this tiny, tiny little Lisp uh, manual in two pages, right? He defines a little Lisp interpreter and he has this neat problem. And it says difficult mathematical type exercise. Find a list E such that the value of E is equal to E, okay? Um, so here E is an expression. So you can think of it this way. He wants you to find an expression that in Lisp or Scheme or Racket evaluates to itself, where the value of that expression is equal to the expression itself, okay? This is sometimes called a quine after the logician quine. Okay, so we're gonna try to find an expression that evaluates to itself. And, and, and he says it's a difficult mathematical type operation, but, not if we have a relational interpreter. So what we could say is we want an expression E where E evaluates to itself. That's it. That's, that's how we write it as a, a, in a relational interpreter. It's basically the exact same notation that McCarthy came up with. We want an expression E that evaluates to itself and I can run it and sure enough, we get this kind of weird looking expression with a bunch of lambdas and applications and calls to list. Now, because this is a theorem, we don't care about the individual variable names. It makes it a little hard to read, so I'll make it a little easier. Underscore zero, I'll replace with X. Okay. Now this is the canonical quine in Lisp. And if I run this, if I evaluate it, I get back the same value. So we just generated a quine. We just generated a program that evaluates to itself through having an interpreter written as a relation. Okay. This is the power of relational programming. We can put unknown variables in any position and have the system solve for it automatically. Okay, uh, time check here. I, I know we started a few minutes late. Uh, how much time do I have left? A couple of things I want to show if possible. Uh, Jason, are you okay with starting slightly later? That's perfectly fine with me. Okay, great. This is worth saying. Yeah, this is worth saying. This is a setup for Jason also. You got, you, got, you got to be excited about it. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to write, I'm going to load a different interpreter. Okay, so that was like a baby interpreter. Uh, now I'm going to load a more sophisticated interpreter. Uh, blah, 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 blah. All right, well, apparently. 
definitely have to load those first. Ah, one second. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, I'm not kidding when I say loading the files. Of this. Oh, oh, that's why, because I'm loading in Racket. All right, so I'm always going back between Racket and, sh and Scheme. And uh, all right. so load full and chirp. Let's see if this works. Yay, OK, it did work. All right, so now I have a more sophisticated version of Avalo. And I'm going to show you a really wild program. All right, so we're going to do a Valo like before. Remember, Valo takes two expression, uh, takes an expression and the va and, and the value of the expression is two arguments. Okay, so I can call this Val if you want. I mean, uh, I'll just call it Q. Okay, now here is the expression that I want to evaluate. Okay, so we've uh, extended our our language, our, our interpreter, to handle a bigger subset of scheme at this point. And so now we have letrec for defining recursive functions, and we have lambda. And here I'll do it with if instead of con, but you could also do it with if uh, if your interpreter is sophisticated enough. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define append in scheme. This is not mini canron appendo. This is scheme append. This is an important thing to understand. Um, and so. I'm just going to do the same thing that I showed you before. This is equivalent to um, where am I? Hold on. Let me make sure I can fit in. Okay, append uh, cutter of L to S. Okay, so this is just a append. There's nothing special about it. This is what we were seeing before. And I can call append of A, B, C to D, E. All right. Now, the important thing to realize is that append here is just a function. It's just the scheme definition. This is not anything special. It's not anything relational or mini canony. I'm just writing it in scheme. But because Avalo is a relational interpreter, it's an interpreter written as relation, we're going to be able to see that we get some special ability. Here, I'm just running it forward. I'm just running the normal scheme append definition, calling it by appending the list ABC to DE. And sure enough, that gives me the expected result, ABC DE, no problem. Where this becomes interesting is now I can say, I want the result of a valo to be the list ABC DE. And now I could start putting Q, my query variable in different positions. So for example, I could put my Q right here okay, in the first position of append. And now I'm saying, you know, what is an expression that when I append it to Q uh, to DE, you know, append that Q and DE, I get A, B, C, D, E. And if I run that backwards, I say, oh, well, Q has to be in this case, the list A, B, C. Okay, so now I've gotten the behavior of appendo, but through just writing the scheme definition of append and putting a logic variable representing an unknown value in the right place, okay? Furthermore, I can actually do a run two. I could say, give me two values. Now, you would think ABC is the only list that would satisfy this. Append ABC to DE gives you ABC to E. There are no other answers, but I can do a run two. Oh, look at this. I got this weird looking expression that when I run it, gives me the list ABC because now we're in the scheme interpreter. Okay, so what this is really saying, this is a very general query. I'm saying any expression in my subset of scheme that evaluates the list ABC actually is a legal solution to this problem. It's a more sophisticated problem. I can always recapture the original behavior by putting a quote in front of it, in which case there is only one answer, uh, but I'm already able to get more expressive power than before. And I know this is a little subtle, okay? You have to see it a few times. Um, but let, let me show you a more interesting example. Now that we're able to put logic variables in different places, I can actually start putting logic variables inside of the code for append. I can say, well, what if I didn't actually know the definition of append? 
let me replace part of the code of append with the variable q. And so I'm saying here, if I want to append a, b, c, d, d, e to get a, b, c, d, e, and I have this definition of append, but I don't know the full definition for append, what code could be filled in here to give me the right behavior? In this case, q should be a call to car of l. Give me the first element of list l. So now I'm doing code synthesis. I'm really doing program synthesis, example-based program synthesis by saying a, b, c, e, and d, e, uh, should get, append a, b, c, d, e, should give me a, b, c, d, e. Now I can start filling in, uh, having the program fill in for unknown values in the code. And I can ask for a second answer as well. I can say, okay, what's the second answer? And I'll think a little bit and say, oh, well, here's another expression you could put in, this more complicated car expression where you have this variadic lambda and L and you know, whatever. It turns out this kind of you start getting into boring examples pretty soon. This is equivalent to just Carvel. Okay, it's a little more complicated. Um, but now you can get into these really interesting examples where you're starting to do real program synthesis. Uh, I can show you a whole bunch of examples here. I'm just going to go ahead and skip to my last example I'll show you before Jason takes over. Um, I want to show you what happens when you push this a bit further. Uh, so let me stop sharing and try sharing just this one screen because I think it will. Uh, the font size will be easier, hopefully. Uh, okay, so can you see the Barlaman window? Does that look okay? Great. All right. <clears throat> so uh, Barlaman is a tool I've been developing with Greg Rosenblatt and Michael Valentine and a few other people for a while. And so basically, this is a wrapper, uh, just a graphical user interface wrapper around what I was showing you for a more sophisticated interpreter that has some heuristics to make it faster. And so here on the left, we have a definition, uh, a scheme definition for some function. And these comma A, comma B, comma Cs are logic variables representing unknown values. Okay, so we don't know the name of the, fun of the definition. We don't know the arguments of the function. We don't know the body of the function. We don't know anything other than we have a function, all right? And we're gonna have Barlaman fill in those values from uh, some examples. So I can say I want to append the empty list to the empty list to get the empty list. Okay, so I, I put in the expression up top and the value down below. And now Barlaman thinks and it says, okay, here is a definition that would satisfy that particular example. Okay, so we, you have a function called append. It figured out the function is called append and it says, okay, this function takes any number of arguments. That's really how to read that. And it always returns the empty list. Well, that's true, but it's not very interesting. So let's give it a second example to make it a little, think a little harder. So we can say, you know, I want uh, the list A to the list B. When you append those, I want it to be the list AB. Okay, so now Barlaman thinks, and it comes up with a more sophisticated example. Um, but if you notice, it has the list AB <laughs> inside of it. Uh, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Fill in a little structure here. I'll fill in variable names uh, just to make it a little easier to read the code. So we're not going to see theorem type answers everywhere. So here's the function I came up with append lambda ls. Okay, it figured out, uh, well, I, I gave those names in this case. And then it figured out that there's an if test and it should return s in, in, uh, in one case. Okay, uh, but it has this hard coded list ab. Well, there are various ways around that. We can say, well, let me just give a second example. Uh, where you're using C and D instead of A and B. And that should give us back C and D. And I'll think about that. Okay, and now it uh, no longer is specializing to have the list A, B in the answer. Instead, it's actually starting to do cars and coders over L. Okay, so now we're getting closer, but we don't have the recursive call. There's another way, by the way, to keep it from uh, cheating and over specializing, we can use what are called Lex3 gen sims or scolum variables, scolum constants, um, and say, hey, you know, what we really care about is the structure of the computation. So we're going to have sort of generic placeholders for the actual values. And that also keeps from over specializing. And now let me add one more example where we have the recursion. So let's say, if we have the list G3 to G4 and the list, list G5 to G6, that should give us uh, back the list 
G3, G4, uh, G5, G6. Okay, so now I'm giving it a longer example with longer lists and it has to think a little more, but now at this point, it actually, whoops, um, it actually uh, comes up with a definition that's recursive. And this is the correct recursive definition of a pen. So we're doing um, recursive program synthesis through relational interpreter based on just giving input. So we, we get a program synthesizer as emergent behavior uh, from writing an interpreter as a relational program in this style. Okay, now there are lots of other examples I could show you, uh, but that's, you know, sort of uh, gives you some idea of what we're trying to get at. Now, let's see here. Oh, wow, there are a lot of comments in chat. So let's just look through. I don't know if there are any questions here. Uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah. Do we have time for a question, I think? Can we ask maybe one or two? Yeah, maybe okay, we can sure. ask one or two questions. Yeah, open, okay, I'll open the floor first. If there's no questions, I would like to ask some of my own. Okay. Any Anyone wants to ask any questions? Uh, I have a question actually. So uh, you mentioned about Prolog earlier. I'm just wondering uh, whether there's something similar to like the non-pure operators in Prolog, like the bank operator in uh, Canran, mini Canran. Yeah, that's a good question. So you can certainly add those operators. And if you read the reason schema, either edition, you'll see their operators conde and condu uh, that are non-logical. You know, so uh, bang operator in prolog is what's called cut. And that prunes the search, that avoids backtracking uh, with the search. And so uh, you can do that in, in the original versions of mini Canrin. Uh, that was an important set of operators. So, you know, so it's not quite cut. We have operators have a little more structure than cut. Uh, there's something called committed choice, for example, committed choice non-determinism, which is sort of like a local cut that you can reason about maybe a little better. Uh, so Conde and Condu are light cut. Um, and you can have other operators, there's something called project. So you can do all those things and sometimes those can be useful. There's another approach also uh, that, that can give you more power, which is called delayed goals, where you can say, uh, here's a relation, but I don't want to actually run the relation until the arguments, until some of the arguments no longer contain logic variables. That can make it easier for you to implement things or make it more efficient. And that's also something we've implemented a number of times, these delayed goal mechanisms. That can also give you uh, power. However, the problem with with the, 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 the cut operator, that bang operator, in my opinion, is it well, I mean, it can be tricky to use, first of all. But the other issue is that, and if you don't use it right, you can lose answers, you can miss answers that should be there. Uh, but the other problem is that using cut can, can inhibit the behavior, the relational behavior I was showing you. So if you start using cut, then you can't use, you can't write programs like that relational interpreter. You, you may be able to do it in, a, in certain very, very restricted cases, okay? But you can't do it in general. And this is why, in my opinion, uh, the prologue people have never written these sorts of programs before, is that the language is set up where you think about things like cuts instead of thinking about relations. You, you, know, you don't have the right operations in prologue to actually do relational programming. Uh, and so in prologue, when you have a problem you want to make something more efficient or more uh, be more expressive, you go to things like cuts and is and asserts and retracts. And there's a whole bunch of operations to control the search or to, to add or remove information from the global database of facts or whatever. But all of those operations, <clears throat> set of, bag of, and so forth, those are all non-relational. As soon as you use any of those operations, your program can no longer run as a relation. So that's in my, my mind why Prolog is a logic programming language and Mini Canron is a relational language. We want to keep that relational features, you know, the ability at all costs. And, you know, that means that we've had to come up with other techniques and other constraints. Uh, I didn't show you all the other constraints we have. We have a few others, uh, but we had to make sure that every single operation we support allows relational programming. So I, I don't use Conde or Condu. Okay, I just I haven't used those in years, even though they exist, and you can you can use them or add them to an implementation uh, of Mini Canron. 
I, I, I refuse to use them because as soon as you use conde or conju, your program can no longer be uh, run as a relation. That's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Noah, you mentioned you had like several of your own. Maybe yeah, just keep it. Yeah, just just ask one. I, I found it interesting, and I think uh some some people might also find it curious that you mentioned that negation is difficult to represent. Yeah, yeah, negation is really the uh, the heart of the trickiness of logic programming and relational programming. Both of them, I think. So so the problem is. So, so maybe you've already seen this in computer science. In computer science, we tend to deal with constructive logics instead of classical logics, if you've noticed this. You know, so if you get into logic, there are things like intuitionistic logic and constructive logics, where they're based on the idea that you, know, you need to, to uh, construct a proof, or you need to construct the entity you want to talk about. Okay? It's not enough to just say there exists some platonic object and you know, we don't have any idea how to build it, but we're going to talk about it. In, in, um, in computer science or programming languages, you often need to talk about the object um, and be able to construct an object with those properties in order to talk about it in a, in a real way. And so this is like an idea of a constructive logic or constructive proofs. And mini Canon very much works this way, where if you want to talk about an object, you actually have to find it or construct it somehow. And if you want to talk about an object not existing, you have to prove that there's no way to construct it. And that's the hard part because in general, the search spaces that we deal with are infinite. There are infinitely many programs if you're doing program census. There are infinitely many terms you can construct. And so you have to prove that no possible way over all the infinite uh, possible terms or execution traces or whatever that you can consider, none, none of those can possibly lead you to the thing that you care about. Okay, in order to talk about negation. And that gets tricky. Now you have to talk about infinitely many cases, usually, um, in order to prove anything. So that's tricky. And if you don't do it right, you can get unsound behavior. And in general, the negation will often leave you, lead you to an infinite loop. And uh, in particular, one source, of, okay, I'll just show you one example where we run into, this is sort of the classic example. Okay, so I'll go ahead and show this to you. I, I, in fact, I, I told you this is where I was uh, doing some sleight of hand. Okay, so I'll show you the sleight of hand. <clears throat> um, all right, so the sleight of hand is when I was defining appendo before, I'll just define it real quick for you. Okay, we had ls, l plus s. If you remember, I did a little trick. So I said, if l is the empty list, then uh, S and L plus S are the same, that's fine. And otherwise, I said we had a fresh, which is AD res, and then we're going to unify uh, L with the cons of AD. All right. So this is all fine. This is all exactly what I did before. But there was one thing I did that was super important. And if you don't do it, uh, you're in trouble. And Endo D S res. Okay. Now, when I originally wrote the code, it looked like this. Okay. Notice the recursion was in the middle of the two equal equal calls. And then what I did was some sleight of hand and I reordered things. Okay. Why did I reorder it? Because negation. So let me show you the difference. If I do um, a run six, well, actually, I'll just do like a, um, yeah, I'll do a run six. If I do a run six Q of appendo of A, B, C to D, E, to give me Q, okay, uh, oops, whoops, sorry, X, Y, of X, Y, and I want to do X, Y to give me A, B, C, D, E. This, this is the example I was giving you before. Okay, so there's six ways to uh, build up a pending of, of two variables, x and y, to give me a, b, c, d, e. Okay, so and I, I made those all pretty and we looked at them, okay? Now, there is not seven ways though. So if I ask for seven answers, what does that really mean? It means I have to prove that there isn't a seven answer. That's actually a form of negation. 
It's, it's not enough for me to, 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 to say there's a run seven and to get an answer back and it's only six. That means I proved that there are only six answers. Now, if I go back to my definition of append and I reorder it so that the appendo was in the middle of those two equal, equal calls and now I do the run six, well, I still get back six answers. But if I do a run seven, now I'm saying you have to prove that there is not a seventh answer. Now it goes in an infinite loop. This will run forever. It's going to search forever. It'll take up all the memory on my computer eventually. Okay. Because it's going to look forever to try to find a proof that there isn't a seventh answer or to, to find a seventh answer if it doesn't exist. So this is, this is the problem with negation is that in general, in order to say that there are only six answers and there is no seventh, the system has to prove that of all the possible infinitely many terms that could exist or that do exist, that none of those infinitely many terms is the one you're looking for. And so that's actually the real heart of writing many Cameron programs. That's the real art. It's not hard to write a many Cameron relation. It's usually pretty easy. What's hard is writing your many Cameron relation in such a way where if there is no answer, the search will terminate and say, nope, no more, no more answers or failure instead of going in a infinite loop. And in many Cameron, actually, there is no distinction at some level between an infinite loop and no answer. Okay, we, that's part of our semantics. If there is no answer and you do a query, you can either get back a, a finite failure saying there is a proof that there is no answer or it can go in an infinite loop. It's allowed to do either one, okay? And only if you write your programs very carefully will you get the finite failure and it comes back and says, no, no, there is no answer. But if you don't do it very, very carefully, it's gonna go in an infinite loop. And in fact, because of undecidability in general, that's, that's gonna be the case. But, but often we can do better. Anyway, that's the real art. You know, writing your program to deal effectively with negation so that there are no, you know, so your program uh, terminates when there are no extra answers. And that's one of the reasons we have certain constraints because th the trick is when you have infinitely many possibilities, if you can come up with a set of constraints that are effectively lazy, that allow you to represent infinitely many things as a single constraint, then you have a chance at least of being able to talk about negation in a way that's not gonna go into an infinite loop every time. So that's where a lot of our constraints come from uh, to make sure that we can talk about infinitely many things without having to deal with recursion, just having one constraint in the system that can fail um, you know, finitely. So anyway, that's the whole art. This really the art of logic programming and it's really the art of relational programming is trying to deal with negation uh, without going in an infinite loop. That's where it gets hard. So my, my thesis is that most work on logic programming is actually about negation. If you look at answer set programming, that's all about dealing with negation through cycles and things like that. So most of the really advanced research in logic programming is about trying to handle negation in some sense is my argument. Same with relational programming. Okay, good question. All right. Well, uh, I'm sure we could talk for a long time, but Jason's gonna blow our minds with uh, showing us how to implement some mini Canron. So I'll give time to him. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Will. What a warm up. <laughs> a wild Olivier <laughs> Don V appears and says, you don't say. <laughs> That's right. Hi, Olivier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Neg it's all fun and games until you have to deal with negation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By the way, the first time I ever show showed that relational program, uh, the relational interpreter uh, in public was <laughs> in front of Olivier. And Dan and I found a bug the night before. I never told you the story, Olivier. So Dan and I stayed up all night. I stayed up all night like fixing the bug and I invented invented this new type of constraint to get around that problem. And then we were like trying to frantically update the paper. And so when I gave my talk, I was like, I, I think I had about half an hour of sleep. And, and afterwards you're like, yeah, you know, your talk is good, but you should have more enthusiasm or you have more excitement. I'm like, <laughs> I, didn't, I, just, I didn't tell you, but he's like, I had no sleep. <laughs> I was like dragging myself in, oh. but yeah, that was, that was fun. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. All right. Jason. All righty. So, um, 
let me uh, start off this show then. Uh, my plan for the rest of this evening is to show you all pretty quickly how to implement one of these kind of Canron things in your own favorite uh, functional language with a minimal feature set, more or less if you can write uh, 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 higher order functions, and if you have a minimal set of data structures, uh, constructors, if your language is memory managed, then, uh, or garbage collected, then you should be able to roll one of these in just about any host that you like. Uh, where we found a lot of traction from people has been, uh, I'd say, the question is, uh, if I approach my boss and this logic programming stuff, this relational programming, it's really great for the task at hand that I'm working on. Uh, this, this would be the perfect place to use this kind of Canon programming stuff. Um, and I got to ask my boss either, hey, can I add prologue to our development stack? Or are you going to let me add another library for JavaScript, for Java, for Perl, for Python, for PHP? Um, and it tends to be that just adding another library is the more likely way to go. So in places when you need to roll your own relational programming language for a, a one-off fix to get something done, uh, we kind of believe that language-oriented programming is often the way to go for whatever the problem is. The solution is to write a language in which to solve that kind of problem. And for certain kinds of problems, these canrins end up being a great tool for the job. So I want to tell you how to add this to your own toolbox. I'm implementing this in Racket. And my plan is to use uh, Racket's numbers to implement our variables. I started with a little bit of setup here just to talk us through. So. Um, we can see that the definition of on line four, constructing a variable is a magical version of the identity function. It takes a number and we sprinkle it with variableness and that makes it a variable such that when we ask if it's a, var a variable, we're just asking if it's a number. Our terms, the language over which we're gonna be doing equal equal is a language of binary trees with data at the leads. So our, uh, our terms are gonna be made of symbols, uh, the empty list, variables, and conses or, uh, of the proceeding. So the ground terms, terms without variables in them, is the set of terms over no variables. Um, and so we can start giving the meaning to some expressions here. Uh, one thing we might do is uh, give meaning to variables in a certain kind of way. So we're going to have to as we go through and provide meaning for variables via equal equal, we're gonna have to keep track of that. Keep track of the structure of information that we've already learned so that when we come through and learn something else, we can make sure that it's consistent with the things that we already knew. So I might, let's say, add that, uh, well, variable zero is the same as variable one. Okay, that's useful to know. And we found out that many Cameron doesn't make any more commitments to what variables have to be to ensure equality than is absolutely required. Uh, several times, Will showed us some examples of queries where we saw underscore zero, underscore zero. Um, in other worlds, you might have imagined that started picking out, oh, well, it could be horse, it could be cat, it could be turtle, it could be lobster, but we didn't make any more commitments than were necessary. So likewise, if we said two variables are the same, uh, we track only that commitment, that zero, variable zero has to be the same as variable one without any more information than necessary there. 
And we might come along and later learn that, oh, variable one, someone says that's the same as variable two. And variable two is the same as variable three. Um, and finally, let's say variable three is the same as the symbol cat. Uh, and we might learn this via four calls to equal equal. And this is the kind of structure that we've got. It turns out Racket has some built-in operators that work very well with these kinds of structures. So ASV is the name of a structure to look up uh, in this list of pairs. You can think of it like a list of key values. Well, if I look up zero, that'll get me back the pair zero, one. Oh, and so I know that means one. Well, then I'll come through and find out what does one mean? Oh, well, I find out that's two. And this is in a way of keeping track of our data, like the most recalcitrant, uh, ornery, least helpful kind of uh, uh, person you could be asking questions to that doesn't give you anything more than is necessary. But we can sure enough go through and if we keep poking this stru data structure long enough, we'll eventually get to, okay, well, finally, if I know what three is, then I can find that's cat. Okay, well, then I'll look up what is, I might even go as far as look up cat. Well, that's not in there. So cat itself was what I was after, sure. And one thing that's convenient about this is every time we learn something new, we can just stick it on the front. The downside was um, when we look up what zero means, we have to follow this chain of understanding until we finally, honest to goodness, get to the meaning of one of those terms. So the first thing I wanna do is develop an operator that'll let us, and this sort of structure is called a substitution. Uh, you can think of the function substitution that you might've seen in your uh, in some introductory classes as the, the model by which we think of applying a function to a value. But I'm thinking of a substitution as a data structure. In the same way, if you're following some, uh, the statistics for some sports game, you might see the, the coach made the following substitutions in the sixth inning. It, this and this and this and this, um, okay, and that's the substitution that the coach made for the hockey team. It's a, a noun, a substitution. And so from within this substitution, I want to find, be able to find the honest to goodness meaning. If there is a non-variable term to which some variables associated, I want to get that back. Otherwise, I, I want to just get the same thing back because Variable four doesn't mean anything other than variable four. Variable five doesn't mean anything other than variable five. So define walk. And that's our name because we go down this and keep walking through it until we finally come to the end of our walk. And you don't know how long you're going to perambulate. Let's walk a uh, term T in some substitution. And I'm going to go ahead and try and find that using that same ASCII operator. And we know that every time that returns a pair or it returns false. And if let's say 3.4, uh, 3.cat, then we have a pair, we do not. So, that one, we have a pair. There we don't. So I can ask if we have a pair to, well, I want you to go walk the cutter of our pair. That's the right-hand side of our pair. How about we'll do uh, define, save those for later. Car and cutter, left and right-hand side of a pair. Okay, define car, uh, RHS car, and define RHS cutter. So we'll look up the right-hand side of that pair in that same substitution. And if it's not there, 
then we'll return the element t that we looked up. Pardon me. So we'll walk, I don't know, how about zero in that structure? Oh, and we can lickety split, keep drilling down into there until we find the actual information that we wanted to get out of it. This does present a certain kind of problem. For instance, what happens when I try and walk uh, zero in the binding of zero to zero? We're walking, we're walking, we're walking, we're walking. Um, and you can see we don't get anywhere, but it takes us a long time to get nowhere. So I want to suggest that we be a, uh, a little more careful about what we allow in as a substitution. The problem here was that we allowed ourselves to put something on the right hand on the right hand side that was in the either equal to or anywhere in the left hand side. It's no better if we have, well, variable zero means variable one. Also, variable one, that means variable zero. Oh. All the way down. So we need to be very careful about our notions of equality and make sure we don't introduce any substitutions. Uh, sorry, any uh, cycles. Uh, circularities would run into problems for us. And this is going to about to making sure that whenever we add equational information, whenever we add equalities, we're doing so in the realm of finite trees. If I allowed circularities, then we'd be allowed to represent infinite trees, something like where equal equals zero to the uh, list cat zero. Well, what does that look like? It's a list with the first element cat and the second element, well, that's a list and its first element's cat, but its second element, well, that's a list. So we're gonna forbid those kind of circularities. And I'm gonna be able to do that by taking a look to see what we've got before we, we need to be a little more careful. We need to have a bouncer uh, that checks checks at the door before we allow stuff into our substitution. I want to find out whether what we're looking for occurs in, uh, in this term relative to some substitution so that we make sure we don't get into one of these situations. Whether some variable occurs in some term relative to the substitution. Um, Jason, well, sorry, could I just interject for a while? Uh, yes. Just to, I guess, clarify some things. Um, so, uh, I guess it might be a good to also like talk about what the numbers represent. Because when I first oh. like tried to write my own mini camera, I also was curious like why are there numbers and stuff like what's the zero, right? Oh, these are these are supposed to be for us. I'm treating uh in my mini camera, uh variables as. Uh, or numbers as variables. Mm. I need to keep track of every variable that I use so that I know how to get another variable that I haven't used before. These semantic variables assume that they're linearly ordered, uh, and, that I can, there's an infinite sequence of them and that I always know how to get the next one. Numbers are a really great ordered sequence. And on a substitution list, the left, one is your variable and the right one is based what is bounded to, right? Yeah. The in a substitution, it's a, a list associating pairs where the the left hand side is a variable and the right hand side is one of these terms. Yep, makes sense. Thanks, Jason. No, thank you. Uh y'all all free to, uh, feel free to jump in. Um, you know what everybody else in the room knows about uh, programming a lot better than I do. You all have a lot more similar programming foundations than I do to what you all know. So any questions from one of you is probably good for everybody.
So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go find out what this uh, what this term T means, because I who knows what it came in with. Let T be walk T and S. So now we know we've got the actual honest to goodness meaning. And that term T can now be only one of three things. It's either a variable, it's a cons, or it's otherwise some, some constant symbol, cat, dog, horse, fish, turtle, that kind of stuff. If it's a variable, how do I know if it, uh, if X occurs in that, uh, in that term? Well, if they're equal, and this is my little equality operator. It's the, for reasons we don't need to concern ourselves with, that's good enough to be equality for me. If what we've got is cat, dog, horse, turtle, then I know the variable doesn't show up in there because no variable is the same as one of our constants. Our constants were symbols or the empty list and our variables were disjoint from those. So we've got non-overlapping types here. The other thing that we might run into is it might be a cons, one of those structures where we've got a left and a right hand side. If what we've got in our substitution is actually uh, a tree with substructure to it, then the variable occurs in that tree if it occurs in the left-hand side of the tree relative to our substitution, or if it occurs in the right-hand side relative to our substitution. Um, and the question marks are skinny, rackety for, uh, for des uh, describing something predicate-like. Well, so we can check and find out that uh, occurs before I go ahead and add one and zero to that structure. We could check, find out and check one, zero in the substitution 0 0.1. Oh, it's in there. Since that's already in there, I better not try and add this thing again. What if it was we were adding to the pair cons uh, cat 0. Uh, uh oh. Where did I get? Hmm. Oh, good for me. Got to make sure and pass along all three arguments. Oh, that's what Racket was complaining about. Way to go. Sure, there we go. And no matter what, we, we can find out if we've got something in there. So based on our exhaustive test suite, we now know how to tell if something's uh, if some term uh, shows up in a variable with respect to the information we already know, we know how to, for any term, uh, drill down and find out what it actually means with respect to, uh, with respect to the information we already know. And so I think that we can now get to uh, being a little more, bit more rigorous about how it is that we add new information. So to extend a substitution with a mapping between a variable and a term and some existing substitution, we're gonna make sure that we only add that new association in provided it doesn't create a circularity of some kind. So if it show, turns out that X occurs in T with respect to that substitution, then we're gonna say, Oh, no, you, you just can't add that. That's, that's a failure. Otherwise, if it's OK to put in, then we're going to go ahead and construct a new pair with x and t, and we'll stick that onto our existing substitution. 
So rather than having to go in and mess with these by hand, we'll try one and cons cat zero onto the existing substitution zero dot one and good. We'll find out we can't, you can't add that in there. However, if we were adding it on to, let's say any other variable, we'd be, we'd be just fine. So I've shown us so far based on this term language, how to, with these kinds of substitution data structures, get information out, find out if it's okay to add something and how to add something where we check if it's okay. Um, this is inches from being able to implement that equal equal operator that Will showed us how to use, the equal equal of two terms together. The heart of that is a tool called unification that you'll see show up in artificial intelligence and people who work in types, people who work in relational logic programming shows up all over the place. Um, and it's a really cool operation because it both acts as the kind of thing you'd use for assert in certain kinds of programming languages. It gives you the behavior of predicates to check equality. It gives you the behavior of assignment all at once. It's a really flexible, cool kind of tool. So define unify and we'll unify two terms with respect to a substitution. What this really means is unification is a kind of two-way pattern matching. I think of it like if I've got two trees, uh, A, B, underscore, where this is like a wild card or a variable, uh, C, D, and I've got another tree, blank, blank, D. Can I, is there a way that I could fill in these wild cards so that these two are exactly the same thing? That's what unification means. It means find me a way by pattern matching to fill in the blanks so that the two things I've got are actually factually syntactically the same. And remember, no cycles. That's the goal of unify. The, the underscore dot zero, by the way, uh, when we see it in the output answer, that is to re uh, respect the same kind of notion of underscore meaning wildcard. And the dot zero, that's a subscript. The first thing we're required to do is know what it is we're talking about. So T is what we get for uh, T1 is what we get from walking T1 and S to know what it is we're talking about. Same thing with T2. So now that we found the meaning of these terms with respect to our substitution, we know what flavor of thing that we've got. There's a couple of choices to consider. Our terms are trees over this structure. So each one of these terms that we're looking at is either a variable it's some kind of constant, or it's a tree with substructure to it. And I want to find a way to make these two syntactically the same, add the, the minimum information I need to the existing substitution structure to make these two things exactly the same. Well, the easiest case is if they're already the same. If it turns out that they're already the same, well, then my work's done for me and we don't have anything to add. That would be like um, trying to unify zero and one in this structure. Oh, well, those are already the same thing. We don't have to do any work here. So let's assume they're not already the same. If one of them's a variable, well, then what I want to try and do is 
to uh, add this information of we've now figured out by looking at it, I've got a variable seven. And the other thing I've got is, I don't know, something, some other kind of term cat, or perhaps some kind of term cons seven to cat. So it might be okay, it might be trouble, but if we've got a variable, then, and it's not already the same as this other thing we're trying to add, then we'll have to go ahead and try and add it. Where this one's a variable, I don't know what this one is, and we'll add that to our, uh, but we'll try and add it with respect to our substitution. And if we can add it in, we'll do that. If we can't, then we'll have failed because there's no way to make those two the same. If on the other hand, the other one's uh, a variable, there's several ways we could handle it. The easiest one is, oh, well, we'll call unify and just flip the two. If, oh, I was looking for a variable in the first position, but it turns out I had something else in the first position and a variable in the second. Oh, well, we'll just swap those two around and call it again. Now, this is if one's of R, if the others of R. Now we get to an interesting case. So what about if neither one of them's a variable? Well, I do need to consider the case where what we have are both uh, ter uh, terms with substructure. If they're both uh, terms with substructure, if they're both conses, well, then I'm going to have, then I can make these two terms the same if I can make their left hand sides the same and if I can make their right hand sides the same. Let's try the left hand side first. We can pick. Um, so we'll unify the left hand side of T1 and the left hand side of T2 in the same substitution. And this will either work or it won't. It might be that the, down the left hand sides, there's some incompatible behavior. We just cat and dog. Let, assuming it works. Well, I want to make sure that the same information is consistent with what's going on in the right hand sides. It wouldn't do to find out that Oh, variable zero down the left hand side, you have to make it cat, but down the right hand side, you have to make it dog because cat and dog, those don't get along together. So some subs, some new substitution, some embiggen substitution. And assuming that we got some actual value out of that, we'll try and do this work down the right hand sides. Um, and if we can, and if that works, then we've embiggened our substitution all the way through. And otherwise, false. This is, you've got like two different constants, cat and dog. Uh, we can't make those the same. So the this is a fancy operation that it took people several decades from when it was first discovered and introduced to recognize what they had on their hands. But we can implement the whole thing in basically six lines with some additional lookup stuff. So I think we can give it a whirl. Let's try to unify cons zero one with cons one cat in an empty substitution, what does that get us back? Well, if I load the file, uh-oh.
Is it line 40 where T2 should walk T2? Yeah, thank you. I so love working with uh, it live in front of a group of folk. Oh my goodness, you can't imagine what it's like having to program alone. A no type checker, no group of folk with me. It's, it's mighty nice to have this kind of help. So yeah, uh, we can make these two trees and this is a tree and this is a tree. We found a way to make these two trees the same. Um, and how about we'll add another one, cons this onto two and I'll cons this onto three. And I wanted to point out here that uh, once again, that these numbers are variable. So this is uh, the second uh, variable number two. This is variable number three. And we know that in this substitution we get back. If I walk uh, zero, I'll go all the way through and find cat. But if I end up walking two, we get three back. So we didn't make any more commitments to the values of variables than were absolutely necessary. So we didn't get any more specific than we had to. We left it as general as possible. All right, and this is now inches away from doing what we need to implement um, equal equal. I think we've got, uh, we're well within range of that. Um, I want to think of these equal equal, uh, uh, those kinds of operators as things called goals. So a goal is going to take uh, the, the, the information we've accumulated and return a list of those kinds of answers. So we're going to need to do that. You'll, you might have noticed uh, you might have noticed that when Will did this equal equal, equal operators, you didn't see on his uh, uh, A, B, C dot D, you didn't, uh, and then Q, you didn't see over here in a third position, some big list of pair structure. We buried that behind the scenes. So I'm going to show you how we're going to do that. Define equal equal to take two terms, T1, T2. And so after that, it's going to return a function where behind the scenes, we're going to pass it uh, information about the stuff that we found so far. And I'm going to use that with lambda state. So I'll call the information we've got so far a state. I hadn't quite uh, decided what to do with this, but I think uh, I'll just tell you what we need in a state. I want to add three pieces of information. Uh, well, uh, we'll do, we only need two pieces, I think, here. Uh, our state is going to have the substitution together with a variable counter. Because I need to know all the variables I've used so that when I build the next one, it'll be variable, uh, oh, 17 is the next one. I, so I've got to jump in here, uh, let my subst is the uh, oh, fine first car and second to be the catter. If you don't know these, this is fine. I'm getting the first and second elements out of the list. So subst is going to be the first of my subs plus counter.
And then behind the scenes, we'll, we've got all the parts for our unify. Unify T1, T2, and our subst. And this, as we know, will either succeed or fail. This is maybe a new subst. And we'll just ask about what we've got there. Since it can succeed or fail, if we got a if we got a new new subs, then I'm going to return a list of answers. Mini Canon, we always return lists of answers. Um, so this is going to be a list of uh, well, a list of two things, my maybe new subst, and then the second part of our subst plus counter. If it turns out we, we failed, well, then we're going to return an empty list of answers. There we go. And I should be able to, by starting with one of these structures, give us equal, equal of how about uh, cons cat to zero to cons to one and stack this onto cons uh, cat to horse on turtle. Well, equal, equal, as Will showed us before, gives us a procedure. And it's a procedure. Why was it a procedure? It's a procedure because it's waiting for a state. We've got to give it a state that is a list of an empty substitution and some variable counter. Well, let's see, I've used zero and one. So the next one ought to be two. And here we go. We get back out a list of answers. The first answer has this information in it about our substitution, we still know what the next variable counter is. That's great. I could go ahead and show you how we implement our new variables. There's a couple papers and talks where we do that. So I think rather than doing that, I'd like to show you what the secret sauce is for Mini Canron search. If you want to see how we implement additional constraints, the short version is rather than putting two pieces in your state, you put three pieces in. Well, we'd also need information about disequalities. Well, we'd also need information about uh, maybe what terms can't be equal to one another. This is the additional constraint, a version of the additional constraint that Will mentioned staying up all night to implement. Nowadays, you don't have to stay up all night to implement it. It's basically another five or six lines of code. So the secret sauce for our implement uh, for our search, what makes Mini Canron search more useful than Prolog search, is that it's a depth first search with kind of a biased interleaving. And I'm going to pull out from my uh, scratch buffer over here. Uh, two bits and pieces that are essential to us for implementing the search. This is critical to implementing the search. And these are two functions I think everybody already knows. One of them I know everyone already knows. So many Canron get out of equal equal. We get lists of answers with disjunction uh, disjunction, we combine two lists, two uh, lists of operators. So, for instance, define dish of if I'm combining two goals together, G1 and G2, then what do we do? This is a goal. This is the same kind of goal. So it takes a state.
And what we'll do is we'll run the first goal with our, uh, our state, run the second goal with our state, and we'll return those lists together. So what is disjunction? Disjunction is disjunction of two goals is all the ways we can do the one and all the ways we can do the other. So let's see how about we could either we could be interested in this question or we might have instead been interested in uh, ways we can make cons cat fish equal to the variable zero. So there's two different ways to get out of this we might be interested in. And as you can see, we here's the first answer, here's the second answer, and we just stick them together as you'd expect. When I say stick them together as you'd expect, it really is. Now, surprise, surprise, what is the implementation of this uh, putting together sequences of answers from many Canron? Well, it's our favorite function today, append. If the first list of answers is empty, well, we stick together the second one. If otherwise, what we've got is a cons, we've got uh, one answer and some more, well, we'll stick that one on to appending the rest of them together. And disjunction works in a, per, uh, conjunction works in a pretty similar way. This is for conjunction. Now, uh, Will has pointed out that the, the real cool special operator that he had to add in to start doing a lot of neat stuff was the ability to write recursive relations, the ability to do recursive definitions. I wanna try doing that myself. Let's say something real simple, not very interesting. I would like to either make it a disjunction. What I to make what I've got here a disjunction, where either x is equal to turtle, or call turtles of x. So for whatever variable we put in here, it'd be nice to return an infinite sequence of turtles because I like turtles. So now that we've got our turtles definition, how about we'll try running rather than this goal, we'll run turtles of a variable zero. And we'll try running this in the empty, uh, empty state with the empty substitution together with variable counter z uh, one. And let's see how this does. Should be just about done now. Any minute now. Uh oh, oh boy. So as you might have expected, we had turtles all the way down. What happened here? We said that if you wanted to implement disjunction of two goals, well, you get a state and you figure out the answers to the first one, figure out the answers to the second one, and then you put them together. You evaluate the sub the sub expressions, and then you stick together their values. Well. To evaluate this disjunction, we had to evaluate this one and that one, which surprise, surprise meant we had to evaluate a disjunction, which required evaluating this one and so on and so forth. So once again, all the way down. It's circularities, circularities and cycles again. And I decree that the only way to get out of an infinite loop is to build an escape hatch before you start. My plan is this. What is the value of 
lambda of no arguments on, let's say, oh, define, oh, how about uh, turtles of X, uh, turtles of cat, we know is going to go into an infinite loop. What is, however, lambda of no arguments, turtles of cat? What is this and how quickly does it stop? it stops instantaneously because the value of a lambda is an instantaneous value and we don't peek under the hood until somebody ever actually asks us to run it. So the plan to stop this infinite loop computation is I'm going to stop it instantaneously. Well, we were supposed to be able to have something that all of our goals took a state. Well, okay, and this now no longer takes a state. Uh, I'm using that to stop the computation. So how about we'll take in a state first. And then, then we'll stop the computation. But if somebody ever starts it up again, at that point, we'll run it with the, with the state that we'd saved. What we've done now is made uh, our turtles of zero. If I reload the file, now a push button operation. Okay, so it loaded and it ran. All right, and now we've got one answer. And what's in the, uh, the right-hand side of that answer? Well, it's a procedure. And what happens when I run it? Oh, it turns out we've got another answer together with the procedure. And what happens when I take the right hand side and run it? There's another one and we keep going here. So we've taken an infinite loop and now made it a push button where you got to press it, give it a little gas to go at every step of the way. This does, however, when we do that, uh, we'll flip one way or the other, run us into a little bit of a problem. It used to be the case that what we had was uh, our list of answers were either empty or cons of some answer onto another answer. We now have the option that what we got is a procedure. And until now, we hadn't been able to account for that. So what would go wrong if I tried my implementation this way and I ran that same little program we tried? Uh, okay, uh, well, that's no good. Ah, what's going wrong is we're ending up and I can show you we're ending up in some sort of a default bad else case because we don't have a case to build that uh, answer. Uh, else we are in trouble. And if we run that, we will find that indeed we are in trouble. So my plan is rather than to admit defeat, do something special to account for the this uh, these delayed computations. And if we had to delay a computation in our disjunction, then I'm going to say that we're going to just delay the disjunction. It's uh, you can think of it like a middle manager. If my uh, if one of my employees isn't as done with his work yet and I need all of their work together to present my work, then I'm blocked on them. Lambda, we will also delay. And this delay is going to be the going to be if somebody asks us, if somebody gives us a little more gas, we'll give that uh, subordinate computation a little more gas and we'll keep going from there. So we should now, when we flip this, oh, we should now, when we flip this, be able to, rather than running into trouble, get a procedure and run it and get a procedure. And then we run it. 
and get a procedure and then we run it. And the problem that I'm now facing is that if we've delayed a computation because we were waiting here on the result of some recursion, what we'll do is when we start it again, we'll pick up right back where we left off. So we've got, as soon as we get done with this infinite sequence, we'll have a bunch of turtle answers waiting for us. Likewise, you can imagine if we had uh, turtle and uh, I like turtles and I also like cats. So if I end up running here a disjunction for uh, both turtles and cats, well, I can run that procedure and I'll get a turtle. And if I run the right hand side of that, then I'll get another turtle. And if I run the right hand side of that, I'll get another turtle. And it is in fact still turtles all the way down. So what happens is because we're going in order, every time I stop, I'll start back again with turtles and I'll never get cats out of this, which makes me sad. The solution to our uh, depth first search that's incomplete, the fix to that that lets us do an interleaving search and get all the answers, a complete search is simply to switch the values in that line there. Now, instead, we can run that and get a procedure and running here, we'll get a turtle. And if we run the right hand side of that, we get cats back out. And if we run the right hand side again, we get a procedure where we get turtles. So we can now get in uh, values out of both of them. And this is sufficient to give you the this one of the two secret sauces that makes mini Canon able to do some of the things that as usually implemented prolog didn't have the power to do. And it's for those of you Emacs users, escape control T. It does not make it a, one of the questions in chat, does that make it a breadth first search? No, it does not make it a breadth first search. So imagine what happened. The only way that we end up doing our delays is on these recursive procedures. So if I had a, um, and I can show you this right quickly. Let's say we had a dish chair of turtles, dish, of uh, uh, dish of let's see what happens here if this were a breadth first search then you'd expect to get one answer out of this before we keep going And I always have to uh, well, for some reason we've got uh, so I've got here and then my dish of this and my dish of that. Uh, well, that's exactly the right number of operators. I don't care. Uh, I don't care what it says. That's uh, expected one given zero. Who knows what it wants? So something's being sassy right now. Um, and it looks like my REPL yes, is yes. angry. I'm going to. Oh no. Do what? Is it a state? Did I give it a state? It seems like it must be. 
Um, but we're passing that along as we ought to be. So I don't know quite where uh, something Seems to got... be crying about line 65, I think. Oh, well, that's okay. It could be. I'll tell you what, I don't think I'm going to fix it right now. And that's a decent place to stop anyway. This is not a breadth first search. It's depth first search. And it where we delay exactly on the positions that are recursive relations. What's neat about this is, let me give you a worst case scenario recursive relation. Define never owe. Now that is, that is a mighty bad relation. Um, and trying to interleave this with anything else, you're never gonna get answers out of here, but it's always gonna keep going. So the, the minimal place it turns out that if we don't do any other analysis, that we have to do an interleave to make sure that we get a complete search is at the top of every recursive relation because except for the recursive calls, everything's finite, which is one of those trivial kind of statements. Uh, except for the stuff that's infinite, everything's finite. Um, so we can go breadth first search down the uh, finite portions. And as long as we stop at the first time we hit a, an interleave or hit a recursive relation and interleave there, that's sufficient to give us a complete search. Um, I think that's a decent place to stop for this morning. I, um, it's just a little bit more to go and add uh, disequality constraints if you wanna have something more powerful in your little Cameron. But really it's about 100 to 200 lines, 30, uh, 30 to 50 if you're being super crafty and 250 lines of racket if you want the full generic constraint system but you got to be a bit of a macrologist to make that happen. So thank you all very much. Um, I hope that gives you a bit of a notion about how to start rolling your own relational language. And I hope that this is something that's useful to you in your toolbox. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. Um, is it, do you have time for like, I guess one or two questions? Absolutely. I want to make sure we did. If not, I'll ask. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I guess, um, where do you recommend people new to uh, Mini Karen to, to explore further? You know, after, they, after they've implemented their own Mini Karen, oh, what, what would you recommend? Oh, MiniCameron.org. Um, uh, there, there's a site out there listing all the, everybody's implementation that at least I've seen and a couple uh, research pa uh, papers from workshops uh, and other sorts of stuff, Will's dissertation, a couple other dissertations, a couple master's theses, a couple bachelor's theses um, from folks who've been doing mini canonology and how to apply it to various situations and people have been working on, how do we do a probabilistic mini can? How do we do a mini canron where we add more advanced control operators or I mean, it seems like once you've got a little 150 200 line implementation this ends up being a substrate to do other kinds of like it's not just a tool it's a it's an environment uh, a canvas in which you can start doing science and asking questions all right i owe you some kind of a little whiz bang thing and at the end i'd be able to show you normally that we've got, uh, we can write after a hundred lines and a half hour appendo, but so this time I want to show something else. And of course my Emacs just quit on me. Uh, I'll instead show you something we baked up real recently. This is not quite as, uh, it's in the vein of what Will managed to show us. So what I've got here
is this is just some kind of mini Canron relation. And I'm not going to tell you what it does, but it's, it looks big and ugly and boring and poorly formatted. And the only other thing I can say about it is that this plop relation takes one, two, three, four arguments. But notice down here, this thing, we're only giving it three, which seems odd. So I'm going to go run this thing in the REPL and switch to the REPL. Um, and when I run this relation, uh, run this query with this relation, what I get back out is this big, odd, curious looking list. Which it turns out if I pick up this first part, and copy that out, and paste it back in here. Okay, well, I've got that there. That's a piece. And here's another piece of data out of this. Let's see. And that one ends here. If I pick that up and then run it down here. I get back out the same list. So what we've got here is a quine written in mini canron. It's a mini canron program that produces itself. And I bet you we're not expecting to see that today. So that's the kind of thing that once you've got your own little camera running, you might want to start playing with. And if we didn't have the kinds of tools that we've got, the relational interpreter and a relational programming language, we wouldn't have really thought to ask these kinds of questions, or at least I wouldn't. Have. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Jing Yan. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, Jason, maybe you, would you like to share a bit of the research you are doing nowadays with our audience? Um, sure. So um, there's a couple of things that I think are interesting that I was working on lately. It, um, if, you, if any of you are lispers in the audience, the uh, quasi quote unquote structure that they have uh, for how you can build data structures is way more powerful and scary than I had thought. So I thought that would be a neat tool to try and add to the relational interpreter, but I got to looking at it and holy moly, does this thing go deep. So we've been playing with what it would take to look at that. Another thing that I've been looking at that I've been, I love to talk with, I don't know if there's anybody in here who works with delimited control. Um, we've got this implementation of backtracking that's stream based with some delay to it. And it seems like there really ought to be a multi continuation based implementation of this, but I haven't been able to find the analog. And what's wild about it is these aren't uh, these streams that we've got aren't necessarily data because some of them they do have delayed positions, but they're not co data because they actually can in certain instances terminate. So it's a mix of data and codata together that we would need to be able to append and interleave together. And how to represent that with uh, in a multi-continuation structure, I think is really interesting, cool, fun, open question. Um, I've also been playing with like what other kinds of implementations we could do in array languages or ways that we might be able to improve the translation of many Canron programs if we give modes to them to, and we say how we want to use it, how to make it run like fast Haskell. Okay. 
Uh, cool. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? If not, uh, okay. Sorry, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Wait, how do I? Sorry. Right. Uh, well, I didn't get to introduce Jason earlier. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's a lecturer at the Korea College of Computer Science, and his research interests include functional and logic programming, although earlier he went through, uh, what was that? Uh, strain of uh, something, co data and data. Sorry, yes. I didn't quite get that part. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, um, we will. So, for those of you who have attended, uh, we will appreciate if you would leave some feedback about this talk. And uh, one thing that's special about this talk is that uh, Will and Jason actually got up really early. Uh, they are in the states. For those of you who didn't know. So I think we'll actually have to get up at five and Jason probably six. <laughs> so we are really grateful to have host them this time. And uh, once again, Will, if you're still there, and Jason, I'd like, really like to thank the both of you for really waking up so early to come out and share with us what you've been doing. Thank you. For, uh, this was a great way to start a Friday morning. Yeah, thank you. This was fun. It's always fun talking about this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Will and Jason. Will, are you doing any Hangouts or uh, uncourses right now? I think I'm probably going to start one soon. OK. I, you know, so I've done anybody... a few mini Canron uncourses in the past, and I'll probably do something. I'll probably do something again soon. I, I feel the itch again. So. If, so if you're interested in doing more with that, you may want to stay tuned. And uh, it's fun to hang out with. Yeah, definitely. All righty. Thank y'all all. You have a great rest of your night. Thank you. This is fun. Thank you to yeah. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.